So Emma, Emma Hilton is from the UK. She is an academic developmental biologist, director of Sex Matters, a special interest in fairness in sports. She's a consultant with sports federations and author of one of the most popular scientific papers ever published. Fantastic. That's really good. Do tell us exactly how what the name of that, because then we can all, all read it. That's absolutely brilliant. OK, so over to you, Emma, and thank you so much. So um, thank you for having me. Yes, Emma Hilton. I'm a developmental biologist. I'd like to remind everyone I am not a sports scientist. This has been pointed out to me several times over the last couple of weeks. Um, and, and that's a bit of an in-joke. I can talk about it afterwards. Um, so most of you may know me from Twitter. I tweet as fond of beetles. And like I say, I'm a developmental biology. I spend my day, a developmental biologist, I spend my days mostly looking at how nerves grow, at how muscles grow and what happens when they don't grow very well. I spend a lot of time looking at chromosomes. This is an X chromosome in the arrow here. It doesn't look like an X, but never mind. Um, what I definitely don't do is study beetles, um, even though they are very, very pretty. Um, so just a brief intro uh, to think about how we're here. And a lot of this has been covered already. There'll be some new stuff, but this will now be familiar for people. We're here because over the last nearly 20 years now, our sports bodies have failed to take into account fairness for females in our own sports category. And what we've seen is an increasing number of males, strong males, big males, good males, participating in female sports and taking spaces, spots, resources, removing women from the sports category that was designed to protect them. And we have ended up last year here. This has been sponsored at the highest level. This, this lack of consideration for female athletes goes all the way to the top until last year we see at the Olympics in Tokyo, a male take a platform on an Olympic weightlifting stage. And it should, it's not gonna be surprising to anyone watching here, or indeed as I think Cynthia said earlier, even Stevie Wonder um, could see why we have male and female sport. We know that males have advantage in sport. We know that males look different to females. We know they have a set of physical differences in terms of things like height, the length of their bones, the amount of body fat that they have, the width of their pelvis and that kind of thing. And very, very importantly, the amount of muscle that they have. We know that males have these physical differences. We know that they lead to functional differences. Things like, you know, they've got more muscle, they're stronger <laughs> and, and quite a lot stronger, <laughs> a surprising amount stronger. Uh, a male can punch, you know, two and a half times harder than a woman can. They've got a better cardiovascular system. All of the, all of this from, you know, the physical differences that they have. And these obviously lead to performance differences in sport. Small numbers, maybe 10 to 12% in things like swimming and running, uh, up to very, oh, sorry, up to uh, very large differences when we look at uh, strength sports like powerlifting. And um, just from a biology point of view, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, you know, the human race is divided into male and female individuals. And at puberty, we start to look a lot different from each other. Obviously, we're, you know, we're born with particular reproductive anatomy. That's a very, you know, fundamental difference. At puberty, we start to take different body shapes. We call this sex dimorphism. Both sexes grow, they get, you know, they get taller, um, increased bone density and that kind of thing. Males particularly get taller. They have higher bone density than women. They have far bigger muscles. And, you know, they've got different hair patterns and that kind of thing. Uh, females tend to experience things like obviously breast growth. We get we put on body fat rather than muscle. Our hips widen, not our shoulders. Male shoulders widen, our hips get, get wider. And... I think this is from, I think it's from a few years ago now, a, a sports group in Canada called the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Sport released a policy 
where they um, were arguing for inclusion of transgender women for, for males in female sport. And they released this amazing statement as part of this, this extensive document, which says that um, these are people, so they're talking about males who identify as, as women here. These are people who have been psychologically female, but whose anatomy and physiology for reasons as yet unexplained have manifested as male. And that's just an absolutely astonishing statement because we know precisely why male bodies develop. And that's because they have testosterone. Okay, this is not um, this is not surprising. This is a consensus in biology for decades that a male body at puberty experiences a massive rush of testosterone, and that's what drives this height, these muscle changes, these cardiovascular changes. The normal amounts of testosterone between healthy females and healthy males is non-overlapping. Healthy females run at about one nanomolar, that's just a unit of concentration, don't worry, they run at about one. Healthy males run at about 20. So there's a massive difference in the amount of testosterone that males have at puberty, and that's what drives all these, these differences that lead to sporting advantage. Um, and how we can think about how that sporting advantage, yeah, we could talk about the 10% faster, what does that look like in real life? We look at swimming for quite obvious reasons. Um, if we think about how something like a 12% advantage in the pool looks like in terms of actual numbers, we can take Michael Phelps. Apparently he's the best swimmer that's ever existed. I'm not sure that that's true. His world records are falling. Um, but there's no doubt he was a, a, a quite clearly an amazing swimmer. His advantage in 2004 over the second place male was... 0.08%. So, you know, we're talking really fine margins of when those swimmers touch the finish, kind of, um, I, don't, I don't actually know what it's called, when they hit the, you know, the finish line. And <laughs> um, so he's, he was only marginally ahead of the second place male. If you take the, the winner of the equivalent female event, Michael Phelps was nearly 13% faster than her. And there's all these males that were faster than Petra Thomas. Um, and his advantage over his closest female competitor it was nearly 160 times greater than it was over the closest male. And like I say, there's this kind of idea that Phelps had some kind of unique swimming body, you know, the likes of which would never be seen again. And some of what's said about him is frankly bordering on like myth, I think. Um, but the idea that he's unbeatable is, is not true because actually his world records, as I said, his world records are falling. And um, this is Caleb Dressel, who um, beat Phelps is, I think, uh, 100 meter butterfly record. And um, he's nowhere near as a perfect uh, physique as Phelps. But what he does have is a really, really good start. And so by the time he's jumped in the pool, he's already body lengths ahead of, you know, his competitors. So this idea, and you hear it a lot, Phelps, you know, oh, Phelps is unfair. It was unfair for people to swim against Phelps. This is not unfair. This is normal competitive advantage. This is long arms versus big feet. This is, you know, good stroke cadence versus a good start. These are normal competitive advantages. The sex advantage is massive. And so kind of recognising <laughs> you know, that males have an advantage and that this is about testosterone. This is about how they've used that testosterone to make big muscles and to be tall. Um, the International Olympic Committee had this, you know, task to try and regulate the inclusion of some males, healthy males who have been through a healthy male puberty, trying to understand how they could regulate their inclusion in female sport. And one thing they didn't really ask was, could it be regulated? Was that ever going to achieve what they say was their overriding aim, which was fairness for females? They didn't really investigate that too much, despite there being quite a lot of scientific data that they could have looked at. What they kind of did was said, we know testosterone makes a male, so if you reduce testosterone, you must be able to unmake a male. And that's like talking about unboiling an egg. 
once those advantages are set in, you cannot make a male shorter by reducing testosterone. You can have a small effect on their muscle. We'll come on to that. But you can't unmake a male. You can't unbuild this physique once the effects of testosterone have been cemented in. But they try to grapple with this by a couple of sets of regulations, one in 2003, one in 2015. And basically, they were both aimed at having or permitting inclusion of males as long as their testosterone was at a female level. So as long as they had in 2003, they had to have had, you know, testes removal. Testes is the testicles. That's the source of testosterone males, the major source of testosterone. In 2003, so they needed surgery. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in their home country, whichever country that was, they needed some kind of legal recognition. So in the UK, that would be like the gender recognition certificate. Then in 2015, responding to a human rights angle, um, they jettisoned the requirement for surgery. They, you know, in favour of pharmaceutical suppression, which is very reversible in a very small number of hours, to be honest. Um, they got rid of any kind of legal requirement, you know, some kind of, I, you know, if you were charitable, some kind of article of good faith that these were males who were making some kind of genuine commitment to being you know, living as a woman, whatever that means. Um, so they got rid of that and, you know, males just had to swear that they were females for the purposes of competition. And they just needed 12 months of low testosterone um, in order to, to qualify in female sports. And the assumption was that this would remove male advantage, that all this muscle and height would somehow be undone. And of course, you know, I was one of many people that questioned that and said, well, hang on, have you ever actually measured this? There's, you know, there's trans women out there who are suppressing testosterone. Has anyone ever looked at what happens to their muscles in this 12 months that you're saying um, is sufficient to create some kind of parity with the female body? Um, so this is the, the one of the most, <laughs> excuse me, one of the most popular science papers of all time. Um, so I, I published um, uh, I, 15 months ago now with a, a sports scientist. He is a sports scientist in the Karolinska. We asked the question, let's look at muscle mass in trans women who have been suppressing testosterone for at least 12 months. And what happens? We weren't the only ones who asked the question. And this is a paper by Joanna Harper, who is a trans woman. She's an athlete. Um, Finding the same kinds of things. Look, these, these advantages that are baked in at puberty cannot be undone. There's no amount of testosterone suppression that will, as I said, unbuild a male. And there has been now papers and policy documents, and of course, books, trying to address how, how the International Olympic Committee have taken their eye off the ball so completely here. Um, so as I said, I, you know, we, we had Laurel Hubbard at the Olympics this, this year, a, a male on the Olympic weightlifting platform, a strength sport, one of the, you know, the, the sport in the Olympics that is all about strength. And trying to understand how Laurel made it to the Olympic platform. And I, you don't need to worry too much about what's going on in this graph. Hopefully I'm going to publish it somewhere at some point. What you need to know is that in orange, is how women do weightlifting. This is the amount of weight that women lift. In yellow is the amount of weight that men lift. And in turquoise here is the amount of weight that Laurel Hubbard lifts. And so what we can see is that Laurel Hubbard lifts and it's, it has to be age corrected because Laurel Hubbard is old, okay? So this is age corrected. Laurel Hubbard is lifting nearly 100%, nearly double the amount of women of the same age. This is absolute insanity. The, the chances of this happening for a female weightlifter are one in 2.8 billion, okay? This is a once in a, universe, once in a universe lift performance. Laurel Hubbard was the oldest weightlifter to ever appear in a female category in Olympic history. If you correct for age, Hubbard was 43. Peak age weightlifting is 25, okay? If you correct for Hubbard's age, so you work backwards, we know how, how much strength weightlifters lose in kind of five-year blocks. If you work backwards, Hubbard would have broken the world record. 
okay? And Hubbard was in the Olympics five years after not doing anything for 15 years, okay? No weightlifting, no competitive weightlifting. 15 year break, 43 years old, Hubbard was visually unfit. Hubbard was carrying an injury and Hubbard's strategy was terrible. So you've got two choices here. The IOC are looking at this. They've got two choices. They're either gonna think that Hubbard, bizarrely, is statistically the best female weightlifter the world has ever seen, or Hubbard is carrying male advantage. And what they did was, of course, ignore an awful lot of that. Now, I will not, I absolutely refuse to go on without mentioning the women who were at Tokyo, because I think we, you know, we need to mention these. This is Lee Wenwen. She won the, the women's heavyweight weightlifting. So gold medal. She's very young. She's 19 or 20. She's going to run weightlifting for the next 10 years. This is Emily Campbell, who took the silver medal for Britain. But my favourite for the Americans is Sarah Robles. This is Sarah winking as she's holding this massive amount of weight and winning a bronze medal. She's wonderful. She's got a suffragette tattoo. And she was the woman here on the right who made the press wait 15 seconds when they asked this panel, Emily, Lee Wenwen and Sarah, when they asked about their opinion on Hubbard competing, Sarah made them wait 15 seconds before she said, no, thank you. So since the Olympics, the IOC didn't seem to, you know, take much notice of this. We had a we had a report come out in the UK that was written by the sports councils. So they've got a kind of collected equality group and they produced this report, this guidance for transgender inclusion in the UK. Um, and they of course talk about, you know, sports being inclusive and we want to create opportunities for everyone. But their review had a really strong conclusion, um, which was that the inclusion of transgender people cannot be balanced with fairness. Okay, so for a while, the Olympic Committee have been saying, we need to balance fairness and inclusion as if there's some compromise, as if female athletes are going to compromise fairness to, to permit the participation of a male. What this, guideline, what this guidance did was say, you cannot balance, you're gonna to have to choose. And if you choose inclusion, you are going to have to tell your female athletes why you are sacrificing their fairness in order to pursue inclusion. It was a very extensive document. It was well referenced. It came with lots of supporting data, literature reviews, legal analysis, so comprehensive. They ran it, what we have in the UK called an equality impact assessment. So that means if you're pursuing a policy, you are legally obliged to assess how that affects other people that will be part of you know, whatever policy you're suggesting. They ran an equality impact assessment, the effect on females if sports federations chose inclusion. And that's really important because part of, the, part of this report was interviews with female athletes and with sports administrators and with people who work for sports federations. And this interview report is, is almost harrowing to read. And I know we've heard a really harrowing account today. The quotes in this interview report are, I mean, this tells you exactly where we're at. Some current athletes and coaches described inclusion as being a genuine threat to the future of female sport. Senior administrators expressed disbelief that the organizations hadn't grasped the issues. They were told that funding for their sport or their own success, their own career, would be compromised if they dissented. Women who come from, you know, Black, Asian, minority, ethnic backgrounds rightly argue that success in sport is a key kind of, you know, social kind of mobility tool. And that this is just another example of society letting them down. And Women who are religious, women and girls who are religious, were open that they were self-excluding from sport. And what's horrifying is the female athletes, elite female athletes, and I speak to a lot of them, Linda will speak to a lot of female athletes, who are so scared of talking. They have been warned not to discuss the topic. They've been threatened with non-selection if they raise their voices. 
if they if they disobey if they disobey what their sports led to telling them and one of them said it's easier to keep quiet and acquiesce and it's really important that female athletes have a voice here that, and that we need to try and empower female athletes to speak out. I work with um, a UK researcher called Cathy Devine, who has happily joined me at Sex Matters on the Sports Advisory Board. She's written a paper where she interviewed female Olympians and they talk about not being able to ask questions without being accused of transphobia. So this is Olympic athletes now in their own sport saying they are too scared to talk about what's happening in their own sport. And of course, somewhat unsurprisingly, there were claims that there are trans, transgender women competing stealth. And so we were expecting in 2021, the Olympic Committee had promised new guidance. You know, there'd been this really damning report from the UK sports councillors, which have got a lot of power on the, the international stage. We were waiting for this new report from the International Olympic Committee, how they were going to regulate in light of Laurel Hubbard and that kind of thing. And what they what they churned out was, I mean, I, I don't have words to describe how nonsensical it is. They basically abandoned the idea that we should presume there would be male advantage with people who are male. We should we should work from a position of no presumption of advantage. Now, all sports are divided by almost all sports are divided by sex. And that's because there is a presumption of advantage. Nobody thinks all males are better at all sports than all females. But we presume like for like that males should, you know, if everything else being equal, be better, be faster, run, you know, uh, swim faster, that kind of thing. So this basically undermines sex categories. If there's no presumption of advantage, we have no basis for male and female categories. And even more kind of bizarrely, Richard Budget, who is the medical director at the IOC, is denying the role of testosterone in male advantage. He's saying performance is not proportional to your, to your inbuilt testosterone. And this is something that you've... <laughs> so, you know, there are researchers in the UK looking at this issue from the other side, looking for inclusion and looking for strategies. Even they are baffled by the idea that the IOC has said testosterone isn't the thing that's creating performance gap now that's coming from the point of view that uh, this collective wants to be able to find a regulatory reason to allow males into female sports and testosterone is their hook but still it is mind-numbing it's absolutely mind-numbing that the head of a medical committee can say testosterone makes no difference to your um your sporting advantage and so just to wrap up briefly, this is this is now where we're at. Laurel Hubbard didn't do it. The way, you know, weightlifting is a slightly kind of niche sport. It is a very obvious strength sport. Um, but I think we're all clear from today that this is this is where we're at now. We are at Leah Thomas. We are at a male who is shattering records in US college swimming, who is sweeping championships, who is going to appear at the NC2A finals, and as we understand, is using the female locker rooms um, uh, naked. And so we, we've heard, and it's so, it feels so abstract to, for me to be kind of looking at, you know, Excel spreadsheets and plotting and graphs and that kind of thing. It feels so abstract and so alien when you, you actually hear the personal testimony, personal testimony of, you know, the mum we heard today. Um, we do what we can. There are lots of people analysing Thomas's performance. So, for example, this is one of Thomas's swims. This is where the females finished. This is the male finish. Thomas is bang on in the middle of the male pack here. And um, Thomas is, you know, we're, we're trying to create data. We're looking at how Thomas's rankings have changed. There is very clearly a sandbagging issue. Thomas is holding back at the start of a race and then just finishing fast and taking, taking it at the end. And there's serious concern that Thomas might break some records here. Um, if you look at how Thomas swims, he's very slow in the early race and then picks up very, very late. I can't see a reason why he's so slow in the early race. And for sure, if he, you know, stopped messing around in the early race, he would be faster than Ledecky. And Katie Ledecky, has been described as being better at swimming than anyone is at anything. 
she is quite literally considered the best athlete we have ever produced in humanity. Okay, better than, you know, relatively better than males. She is better, she is the best athlete and it's looking like Leah Thomas might challenge Ledecky's records. And so in response to this, USA Swimming created a new policy for, for trans athletes. And there, I mean, I, I don't think there's any way to include that can secure fairness. So I've, I've got a really hard line on this. I don't, and, and I suspect we all have here, I don't think males should ever be in female sports. And um, USA Swimming took a, compared to other sports federations, did take quite a hard line. What they've said is that you have to have low testosterone for at least three years. And this is true. This is the longest of any sports governing body. I don't think it's long enough. I don't think there can be anything that's long enough. It is what it is. What they also said, and this is quite different from what the IOC have recently recommended. What they said is that an athlete must demonstrate that they have lost competitive advantage. Okay, so, so the IOC is saying you can't presume advantage USA swimming said actually you can and you need to demonstrate that you've lost that so they've kind of taken the opposite route from the IOC and that's quite significant because that that's where we need to be if you are in any way politically minded to allow and I'm not talking to the audience so I'm talking to you know the outside world if you are in any way politically minded to commit some males into female sports the very least you can do is show that they, you know, that they're not carrying male advantage. I don't think that would be possible. Um, but there it is. So USA Swimming announced this. The NC2A is just straight away said, no, we're not applying that. Um, it wouldn't be fair to retrospectively apply mid-season a rule that would exclude Leah Thomas. And so just this is my final slide, just to talk about those in the US who are trying to kind of fight against this. The US has quite a different political landscape to the UK in terms of how things like equality laws are set up. Um, but the Women's Sports Policy Working Group, they're worth checking out if you want to get involved in some kind of activism or, you know, find some resources. Um, they, it's no surprise they are led by swimmers. This is their kind of course celeb now. This is the athlete that they can really dig into, that they can nail down some, uh, you know, get some sports bodies talking about what's happening and, uh, you know, at the level of being around the table. Um, so if you do want to get involved, check this group out. And of course, I meant to, I thought I'd added it, obviously, you know, Save Women's Sports with Beth seltzer in the us so try and try and make make contact with these groups and show them your support on social media that kind of thing i have a slightly amusing story about the tiny differences that are regulated um, in in athletics you'll know that a 100 meter start or a 200 meter start the athletes line up in a row and the starting gun used to be next to lane one right and it was actually a gun someone would pop it it would make a sound there was an argument that be, given the speed of sound that the athlete in lane eight was hearing the start gun slightly later, something like 20 milliseconds, I think, later. So 20,000 of a second later than the athlete in lane one. And that was considered unfair. And so they moved to individual sounds that come from every athlete's starting block. If they can regulate for 20 millisecond differences between one and eight, I have no idea how they're so blind with the 10% difference over 100 metres. It's insane. People are talking about male puberty and how, you know, is that where we draw the line? You know, is there, and I get asked a lot, Linda, I guess you get asked a lot, um, is there an argument for segregation before puberty? So I think there is an argument for segregation before puberty. I think it's probably more social than performance based. I think it's really important for young girls to have their own space where they can learn to be comfortable with their bodies, where they can share, you know, all those socialized things that we have being sweaty and sticky and smelly and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, periods and breast growing and that kind of thing. I think it's really important for young girls to be able to participate in sport where they're not embarrassed about those kinds of things. And for, for, you know, mentors and coaches to be able to talk with girls about that kind of thing without, you know, them feeling shy that there's a male joining them. In terms of athletic performance, you know, we think about elite sports. 
puberty is the majority of advantage, but I, I absolutely would argue it's not the whole male advantage. If you look at um, when newborn boys are born, they go through a little spurt of testosterone in the first six months that, that newborn girls don't go through. And that's been linked to things like um, height acquisition later on. Um, so, and things like uh, BMI, so how much muscle versus fat and what your body weight might be. So I think there is an argument biologically that early on, ma that males might have advantage from birth. Um, whether we can make that argument effectively, I don't know. And I do share concerns about the idea that um, it, it, putting a cutoff at puberty has a knock on effect on how um, puberty blockers are kind of viewed in the sports world. And I'd be very cautious about incentivizing that. 